with the word. Of, we'll begin with the word of prayer. <clears throat> Gracious God, thank you for this day. In uh, uncertain and trying times, we need a word of hope and encouragement, and we thank you for your word that provides that. And guide us as we look through this book of Revelation to see the hope that is ours through Jesus Christ, in whose name we pray. Amen. Oh, okay, Pat. Greetings. Hello. Hello. Pat Farn with us. How's it going? Good. Good. Yeah, we're just starting a little bit late, so um, we finished at Revelation chapter 3, I believe. We're still looking at the churches. So, we'll just jump right in. Revelation chapter 3. We finished up with Thyatira, right? And then uh, this is Sardis. I don't know why, but I'll, every time I look at the, the name Sardis, I think of sardines. I don't know why. It just... <laughs> So, <clears throat> if you'd like to follow along, I'll go ahead. I'm reading from the New Revised Standard Version. And to the angel of the church in Sardis write, These are the words of him who has the seven spirits of God and the seven stars. I know your works. You have a name of being alive, but you are dead. Wake up and strengthen what remains and is on the point of death. For I have not found your works perfect in the sight of my God. Remember then what you received and heard. Obey it and repent. If you do not wake up, I will come like a thief and I will not, and you will not know what hour I will come to you. Yet you have still a few persons in Sardis who have not soiled their cloths, clothes. <laughs> uh, they will walk with me dressed in white, for they are worthy. If you conquer, you will be clothed like them in white robes, and I will not blot your name out of the book of life. I will confess your name before my father and before his angels. Let anyone who has an ear listen to what the Spirit is saying to the churches. Okay. <clears throat> so again, there's a couple uh, of things here. Uh, there's the good and Be dead, absolutely, absolutely. So this kind of the idea that uh, this church was um, thought that they uh, they kind of had the that they were all doing well and spiritually well, but it almost sounds as if they were going through the motions. Um, and one of the concerns is that we it's easy for us as believers. And I, I particularly speaking from a person uh, who has been kind of a believer all his life, it's easy to kind of get stuck in routines and go through the motions without, uh, without uh, really growing spiritually. And this seems to be what was the issue at Sardis. Uh, maybe they were just lifelong church people and they just needed a, to kind of revive their spirits. It's, you know, it used to be like every once in a while you'd have the people come around on the tent meetings to kind of have a, what they call a revival. Kind of get the people all juiced and pumped up and while that was a lot of emotionalism, there is kind of this sense in our life that we have to be careful that we don't get complacent in our faith. And in our walk with God, it can be easy to do that. I'm speaking from personal experience, but I'm sure all of us have maybe have had those seasons in our lives where we were just kind of 
just going through the motions and uh, am I the only am I the only one here <laughs> doing the confession but uh, so I think that's what Sardis was, and as you said they're kind of spiritually dead right I think that's a, I think that's a good uh, explanation to what they were going through and how interesting it can be and oftentimes Jesus um, said this about the Pharisees and maybe there was some of that kind of going on there in, in that church as well uh, where Jesus once said to the Pharisees you're whitewashed tombs you kind of look good on the outside you're saying all the right things you may even be doing all the right things but you're hollow on the inside and how it was for the Pharisees, what, what usually happens, I think a good indicator for us when we need to see that we're kind of just going through the motions is when we get a sense of judgmentalism in us. Um, that's usually, for me, a good monitor that I need to do a little retooling and I need to check, check myself to see Am I, is something getting lost inside of me spiritually? Any thoughts there? Yes, Monica? Makes sense. Makes sense, okay. Yeah. <laughs> and Mel said she needs a good kick. A swift kick up the side on the side of her head. Well, and I think this is this is a good time to express this. Like some of these things in the churches seems a little harsh, but a couple of things we need to keep in mind that these words are being spoken to believers, and it's and it, and we'll see at the end of I'm kind okay. of a little bit at the end of the chapter. Uh, we have this talk about being uh, that Jesus is saying that um, God, lo God, um, he rebukes and he disciplines those he loves. <clears throat> so one of the ways of looking at this, these, uh, these letters to the churches is the sense of a parent to a child. And how every once in a while the child needs a good, I don't want to say slap upside the head, but it's the child needs a good, uh, we need to discipline our children. Uh, sometimes that's not always comfortable. You know, I remember as a kid, the uh, back in the day when we actually, uh, I got a, uh, usually a belt to the back side of my <laughs> body. And my dad would often say, this is going to hurt me more than it's going to hurt you. I, I never really believed that. <laughs> but as a parent, when I discipline the, our children, I understand that concept. Um, and so I think it's a good way to look at these letters. That it's a parent talking to children. It's God talking to his children. And it's, it's not, let me give you another story. When I, my first call was in a town called, well, it was in South Bend, Indiana, known for the Notre, University of Notre Dame. And we lived just next door in a town right next door to South Bend called Mishawaka. And our house was on a main drag, main thoroughfare, Highway 33. Had this long driveway. At that time, um, I had, we were two kids and one on the way. But uh, my oldest at the time, Megan, probably was three, four maybe, four-ish in there. And she had one of these big wheel bikes, you know, with the big, big wheel in the front two wheels in the back and you got the pedals on the big wheel and the, the kids ride those little suckers like a, um, and Megan used to ride that all around in circles in our driveway. And one day I was out there with her and she kind of decided to kind of go off the NASCAR drive, you know, 
left turn after left turn, and she kind of was going straight for the for the street. And I was like, Megan, slow down. She just tooling away. Megan, slow down. Finally, I'm screaming at her, stop. And she finally stops close to the street. And she's got these tears in her eyes. She always kind of had a little sensitive spirit about her, but she's tearing up, you know, and she's looking at me like I'm such a mean guy. But what I was, I was scared. And I was not only scared, I was, I was yelling at her for her own protection. I didn't want her to go out into the traffic and get hit. When we hear harsh things in the Bible, the law, if you will, it's God's way of yelling at us for our protection. It's the, it's the discipline and the rebuke of a parent that loves their child enough that they don't want them to be harmed. And so on the surface, it looks a little ouchy, <laughs> some of these comments, but it's, it's from the perspective of a God who loves us. Yes, Monica. Right. Yeah. <clears throat> Absolutely. Yeah. You can see where people would have this kind of warp righteousness. Got to do this. Got to do that. And God asks us to do things, but it's not for our salvation. Yeah, so we're always called on to do good works as a reflection of our faith and in service to one another, not to earn any favors with God, but, but uh, that's kind of our call. Luther would call it the third use of the law and the catechism. You know, the first use is to show us uh, our sin, you know, uh, show us who we really are. And the second use is to show us that we need a savior and the third use is kind of this curb, this guide as to how now we can live a life, you know, that honors, honors God. Not to, not to get uh, salvation, but to, to live out what it means to be a Christian, what it means to be a follower of Jesus. Yeah. Yeah, it's, um, but we, you know, we, like any child, we, we can be prone to rebellious behavior. Yeah, that's First Timothy three, sixteen. Second Timothy, thank you. Yeah, Second Timothy three sixteen. Yen's quoted about how all scriptures God breathed. Yeah, and yeah, so we we always we we do need sometimes a good kick in the pants, <laughs> uh, and and uh, that's very important for um, for our growth. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. It's easy to become complacent. So the, kind of just to wrap this kind of idea up, going back to my story of my daughter, Megan, who's now 30, not three. <laughs> um, and um, when I'm yelling at her and she feels like daddy's such a mean old daddy, but it's done out of love. There was never any point in my harshness with her that I said, you're not my daughter. You're not my child. And I think sometimes when we look at, look at the scripture, we kind of sense that, oh, is, is it, is it, do I have to do this to be God's child? No, you are God's child. 
And as God's child, um, he sometimes says things to us to help us so we're not being, um, we don't get off the rails, don't get off the track. Um, and the other beautiful thing about this is I always, I kind of learned in psychology 101 that if you're going to have a criticism for somebody, couch it in affirmations, right? So, you know, like if you're talking to your kid, you know, um, I really liked how, like, just for example, say they're playing basketball. I really liked how you were, um, how you were passing the ball. However, you could have been a little better on the defensive side. Of the <laughs> so it's, it's this positive with a negative. Sometimes it's easier for people to hear the negative when they hear a positive. And perhaps that's another way to look at these uh, letters to the seven churches, why there's a positive and a negative. God's, um, as a good parent, he's giving a bit of affirmation along with the, the criticism. Anything else in Sardis here? The white clothing, yes. Here's that uh, imagery, that uh, metaphorical language. White symbolizes, what, when you think of white, what do you think of, right? Pardon? Clean, right. Purity, holiness. God gives us a robe. And I think it's very crucial that God gives us a white robe. He gives us the holiness. So that's a very good symbol of, of uh, holiness. And it's interesting that, that uh, early, in the early church, when they, this is, I don't know why this popped into my head, but in the early church, the rite of baptism was usually on Easter vigil at dark. And the, the adults would actually um, go into the baptismal, it was kind of like a big, huge baptistry that they would go in and get dunked. And they would go into it uh, el natural, shall I say. <laughs> they went in naked, and then they would come out, and the white robe would be placed on them, symbolizing the righteousness of Christ. Coming. So, so there's a little bit of imagery there that was incorporated in the early church rites of baptism. So. Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It certainly is that we. We all need personal revivals on a regular basis. Um, it's it's kind of like being born again. You know, we ha we, we have to kind of be born again. And it was interesting. I one of my one of my favorite contemporary musicians is a fellow Hoosier from Indiana named Rich Mullins, who died in a car crash in the '90s. But he was once talking about how about being, when he was young, he, people asked him, when were you born again? You know, like, was it when you were a child or this like that? And he said, I realized that as I got older and older, I was getting born again two or three, maybe four or five times a day. <laughs> it's just that kind of, we always need to have the spirit continually, being open continually to the spirit's work in our lives. And I think that's, that's what they were missing in Sardis. And it's easy to go through the motions without the spirit. Okay, Sardis. Next uh, on the docket is the, the message or the letter to, the Phila to Philadelphia. Philadelphia, which, which literally means in the Greek, uh, 
brotherly love. Well, city of brotherly love. Delphia is a city. And Philo is kind of a, it's a, another word that the Greeks would have for love. Uh, anybody would like to read that or seven through 13? <laughs> Okay, so what do you glean from what's going on there in Philadelphia? Yeah, that's kind of a positive report. They do have this group of uh, Jewish leaders. Now, the other thing, I was, sometimes the Bible has been kind of seen as bashing Jewish people, but it was Jewish people who wrote it wrote the Bible, but what these folks were, the, um, they were trying to um, really get, uh, it was kind of a power struggle, I guess, I, for lack of a better word, in the early church. Um, the question was, like, all of these Gentile converts were, were happening and coming into the church, and many of the Jewish people didn't didn't know what to do about that. You know, they had kind of grown up like they're the, 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 the ones, right? And, and so how are these Gentiles, what do we do with these people that are not of uh, Jewish background? And what, what are they supposed to do to be a believer? Is it just simply faith? Or is it faith with works, with, uh, you know, following the law? And so there was a real struggle. Like, I mean, if you th think churches have conflict today, this was a real big struggle in the church in the first century. So the church has never been without difficulties and struggles and conflicts. And, but this was a real big one. What do we do with the law now? And so there was some Jewish leaders in these churches, and this seems to the sometimes... John can get a little harsh with his words, a synagogue of Satan, uh, things of that uh, <laughs> nature. But it's, it was this, this group that was trying to say, uh, undermine the idea that it was through faith alone. That you had to also keep the law for your salvation. And we know Paul in his letters is very adamant against that. Because it 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 destroys the gospel in the process, um, and so this group is being called out. The Church of Philadelphia, the, the church was for the most part, you know, doing pretty well, but they they still had this kind of group in there that was that he's again saying, "Be careful, be careful." We, we want to, so, um, yeah, Philadelphia, good old Philadelphia. It's always sunny in Philadelphia, so I hear. What else do you see in there, Church of Philadelphia? Yeah, a, 
a door. Yes, so evidently there was an evangelistic door open to them to reach people. So the guess is that, you know, what that door is open. And how, here's the, here's the beauty uh, and the imagery of, of the idea of the door. And it says something along the lines of, I will, a door that I open and no one can close. And any door that he closes, no one can open. It's again this reminder that Jesus is large and in charge. You know, we've got again in the context of this book is the Roman Empire that seemed to rule everybody's lives. Um, this oppressive government that you know invading their every every aspect of their life. I know that doesn't happen in our world today. Wink, wink. Um, but um, this is a reminder that God is the one in charge. Jesus has it all. The doors he opens, no one closes. That's right. Yeah. And that's, an, that's another interesting story that we're going to uh, touch on as well. Doors are, are interesting imagery. It, it's, you know, and, and we'll, I guess now's as good a time as any to talk about the image of the door. Um, what does a door do? Let's you in or keeps you out. That's right. That's right. Um, we think of gateways, right? Entrances into things. Um, so a door, and, and oftentimes in the Gospels, Jesus talks about himself as the door. You know, and as a reference of himself being the one who is our entrance to God. Um, <clears throat> there's also something in the in the thing about Philadelphia that um, that they're going to be spared from something that's coming soon. I didn't get to research that, and I don't know if, Pat, you, you're able to kind of Google there to see if there is any reference to some sort of event. But my speculation is that um, where they lived was a very, it was, there was a huge fault line that's still there to this day. So there were many earthquakes that occurred in that part of the, of the country, of, which is now modern day Turkey. And I, there was just one, I believe last week, 7.1. Um, whether they were you know, spared from one of those earthquakes that happened. And that, which kind of leads me into a, a, a topic that's gonna be s developed in later in Revelation is that a lot of these awful, crazy, strange events that are talked about in Revelation were events that had happened that they had seen happen. So we're looking at probably the end of the first century. So what had happened in the, in the life of these people? The Temple of Jerusalem was destroyed, 70 AD, right? You had Mount Vesuvius blowing up, 77-ish AD. Um, of course, you had Nero in his... And, and Rome itself burning while Nero fiddled, right? You had other earthquakes, you had, um, yeah, so there were a lot of these apocalyptic things that I think we'll see in the text later on in Revelation uh, of, a, of a ref that, the, the, that will be referenced. So, 
they were seeing end of time things happening in present in their presence as we see end time things happening in our presence and in our generation I'm not entirely sure where i'm going with all of this except oh yeah the sparing did you find it happen to find anything pat or was it i'm scared i'm scared, I'm scared. I'm scared. If I do, I do I'll lose you. Oh, sorry. Well, then don't don't worry about it. But uh, I'd be curious to see if if anybody had had speculations as to what it is. That that's my um, layman speculation, as it, they might have been spared from one of those kind of natural disasters. That uh, that's yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, and, and we, I think a couple of weeks we talked about how my theory is that the end times began at Pentecost when Peter's sermon, when he said, In the end times, your children, your, your sons and daughters will dream dreams and they will prophesy, explaining what was going on at Pentecost. So, yeah, they thought Jesus any day now. We think Jesus any day now. Really, all prophecy has been fulfilled for Christ's second return. Um, and that's that's kind of contrary to what's kind of the thought out there uh, in, in um, I think, most of the d discussions and topics related to Revelation. Uh, so that's kind of a paradigm shift that all prophecy has been fulfilled. We're just waiting for a second, Jesus' second coming. And the, the whole term about time, when we talked about that, the kind of chronos time and kairos time, and the word in the text soon, does anybody have a translation that says, I am coming quickly? I know in last night's group, uh, I think Alan had the, uh, the new King James version. <clears throat> That is probably a better translation of the Greek than I'm coming soon. Because the, 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 the word for time, there's more of that kairos time where it's more of a, a this, it's quickly is different from soon. In the sense that it's not so much a matter of chronology, but when, when he comes, it's gonna be boom. As Jesus said in Luke, I think Luke 24, when the son of man returns, it'll be like a flash of lightning. It's going to be instantaneous. And that's kind of what's this text here is talking about. That soonness is not a matter of like, oh, it's going to happen in the next 50 days or next five, 50 years. But when it happens, it's going to be just like that. Twinkling of an eye, I think, is another <laughs> term that Jesus uses. So... Anything else in good old Philadelphia? So we've got uh, um, mm -hmm. mm -hmm. Don't against each other, brothers, or you will be judged, and the judgment stands at the door. The door, how about that? Yes. Interesting. Interesting. Huh. <clears throat> Another thing about the door is what I always think about the church door. In the past, I think all over the world, when you go into a church, the door was open. Go in and pray in silence. You will sit in the pew. There might not be anyone in the church, but that door was always open. Yeah. It's open to everyone. Yeah. Now they're all closed and locked. Yes. Yes. Times change. That that they have for sure. And that was so special. Like I remember as a child, you know, up to school, going in there after school and sitting and pray. Mm-hmm. And it was just so, so beautiful. Uh, 
Doors are locked, yeah. Yep. So if you're walking down the street and you're driving to your church, you're not going to get in. Right, that's right. Yeah, I remember one church, we, we had the doors open, and uh, and we had them, like, we would keep them open, like, through the week, but we'd also keep them open during the church service. And uh, one day, uh, our organist, car ended up missing and we discovered that somebody had come in must come in f grabbed her keys out of her pocket of her coat and all she had to do all they had to do is hit the little fob on the find out which car it was and away they went it's sad we're going to see this uh, imagery of the door open a little later toward the end of revelation where it's a vision of heaven and how the doors are wide open in heaven which speaks to the inclusivity of God or the yeah inclusivity that the door being a door being open is, is, is also the symbolism that all are welcome, which is what you're getting to, you know, to, to, it used to be that way. So, okay. On to Laodicea. <laughs> Would anybody be interested in reading the to the rest of the chapter there? Okay, good old Laodicea. <laughs> so what are you getting from that part of the text here? What, uh, what's going on there in Laodicea? They've got it made in the shade. They were rich. That's right. Yeah. Yeah. So, and interesting enough, some of the things was it was um, I believe it was a um, it was a place for tourism because they had hot and cold springs, just like the hot springs up in Banff, you know, that attract people. People were attracted there. They had um, some sort of a, a lot of. Uh, this kind of salve stuff that was like a healing property. You know, like 
there are certain places I remember in the States that were places where people would go for like healing. Like there was something about the waters and I, I'm, I'm not yet familiar with all of the geography of Canada, but like Sedona, Arizona was a place where people often go because they had think that there's some healing properties and I think Laodicea was along those lines. They also had uh, um, cloth that was very, uh, made them very wealthy. It was a cloth that was sought out by the Romans and, and also this kind of healing um, therapeutic salve. So it's in the text that Jesus says, get the, the, all these things that are making you wealthy are really making you spiritually poor. Get some stuff from me, get some salve, which from where we get the word salvation, right? The balm, there's a balm in Gilead. Um, clothe yourself. But you see, again, he's saying, you get the robes from me. It's not your own works. It's what I do for you. Yeah, so again, it's this group of uh, a community that's wealthy. And sometimes, right, where, uh, what was it? Sardis had this kind of, they thought they were all doing really well spiritually, but they were going through the motions. Uh, Laodicea had, the, I think, this, I eat, uh, hey, I've got, I, got these big barns and stuff like that and everything's good to go. I'm made in the shade, kick back, got no worries. And sometimes that can cause complacency in our spiritual life as well. It doesn't have to be, but that's all, it's always a danger that we have to be aware of that our affluence can be, can be a dangerous thing if we kind of tr put our trust in it. And I think that's what Laodicea was doing. Um, oh, what was I gonna say about, uh, uh, it reminded me of a story of a, of a colleague of mine who talked about going, he, he, his first congregation was out in a rural community, he went to a, to a, uh, a farmer's place, uh, a member that had not been to church for quite some time and he visited with him and the farmer took him around to this huge farm and these big barns and and uh <laughs> yeah the, the the member said to the to the pastor he said uh you know hey i'm i'm doing great everything's good life is great i don't have any problems or qualms with god and my colleague was, was, you know, didn't miss a beat and said, but, but maybe God might have a problem with you. <laughs> <laughs> and I think that's what Jesus is getting here with the church of Laodicea. You're my children. I love you. Again, remember, these are couched in a God that loves these people. But here's a danger. I think I'd reference the, the Roman um, philosopher Juvenal, maybe last year or the week before, it said luxury is more ruthless than war. That sometimes we have to be careful about our, our, our physical blessings because sometimes they can cloud our uh, spiritual life. And over and over, the Gospels talk about that, right? Yeah. Don't store up your treasures here on earth, but in heaven. Um, Yeah, yeah. Uh, no, I don't. You know, that is, it's, um, I remember after 9-11, how packed the church was for about two months. 
But as things kind of got back to normal, numbers started dwindling and dwindling. And um, and you know, I, at first, I, I that frustrated me. But on another hand, I understand it. And I don't know. You know, it's, it's, yeah, like when things are really hard, we kind of turn to God. And when things are going well, the tendency is to not. And I guess when I was a younger pastor, I was a little more of a judgmental about that kind of attitude until I realized, like David, I'm the man. <laughs> that that tendency is just as strong in me as it is in a member who doesn't come to church and feels like, oh, things are fine. But when they, when, you know, as we would say in the military, when the balloon went up and things got a little dicey, they would be finding themselves in church seeking, you know, a, a, an answer. Like I say, when I was a younger and dumber pastor, I was more judgmental. But now it's like, I'm glad they're coming to seek. And I'm glad that they come to the church to seek the answer even if they're going to be gone in another month or two. Uh, at least they see this place as a place that has the answers to life. Yeah, and I, it sounds uh, quite hard on me when you said this. You are neither cold nor hot, and I wish you were either one or the other. So because... Um, It is. Yeah, being lukewarm is an awful place to be. It's very true. Glad you said that. I'm glad you brought up the, the imagery there that Jesus talks about being neither hot nor cold and lukewarm, wishy-washy, <laughs> I think my folks used to call it. Back to the hot springs, exactly. That's, that's right. That's very good. Yeah. Exactly. It doesn't taste good. Yeah. And, and even the, the, the Greek there, the language is a, is a bit more graphic than spit. It's, it's vomit. And, and you, you, I think the, the King James version even does say that. And that's more true to the Greek there. You know, it's just like that. You know, when you get something in your mouth you don't like, and it's just you get that gag reflex. <laughs> That's kind of the reference there. Um, yes, the Oh. oh, interesting. Okay. It wasn't street preachers. No. Okay. 
Mm -hmm. And God knows that we have resembled signs, but these people were not weak. They weren't lukewarm. Yeah. They took a, a stand. Yeah. They basically went out there with some courage, and, and they just put up their signs for a while to remind them. that was uh, very anti-Christian because the problem was to kind of be a little political, uh, but political first century politics is that the Christians were standing up and saying, no, we will not worship the emperor. We will not worship Caesar. Where, you know, uh, that, or we will not worship these other gods. We will not participate in that. They were putting, they were, they were drawing a line in the sand and maybe what was happening in Laodicea was like, uh, and, and what's happening with some of the, these, the lukewarm, we're going, so what, what do we have to do? We say, we, we worship the emperor, we throw some salt over our shoulder or do some sort of little ritual. It doesn't mean anything. And, and for some of the Christians, they were thinking, you know, just be a part of it. It doesn't mean anything. We can say these things. It doesn't mean anything. And John, and a part of the book of Revelation is, you got to stand up. And and you, you can't, it's, it's not Jesus and the emperor. It's one or the other. A stand has to be made. You're either hot or you're cold. And you can't have it both ways. Um, and that's that's a that's not a new message from Jesus. You know, you can't serve God and I used to, I remember it as Mammon. <laughs> you can't serve God and money or wealth. You know, one of them you got to trust. And it's so yeah. That's there's there comes a point where at the end of the day. And that's what these Christians were doing. And, and if they were standing for the truth and they were vocal about it, they might have a little encounter in the Roman Colosseum with a large feline or some other type of way of martyrdom. So it, it was a matter of life and death. And you can understand why some would say, uh, you know, I don't know. And others stood up and, and John, this, this book is saying, stand up and remember that there's a kingdom that is greater than this Roman empire. Yeah, it, it's 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 a um, I, I I remember. <laughs> well, I'll just put it this way: society is is uh, we're I've said it and I'll say it over and over. Twenty first century is so much closer to first century in terms of what the Christians had to wrestle with, then I, we're, we're more in tune with that century than we are with maybe the 16th century and the 17th century, you know, with the rise of the Reformation and maybe even the 18th and 19th century where Christianity was kind of the uh, religion of the realm. And it's not anymore and it's becoming less. Now, to me, I don't, I don't fear that. And I look to history because 
when the church has thrived, it's usually thrived when it's been under persecution. Now, that being said, there are moments where I kind of miss the good old days when the church had some sort of a standing in culture, when Christianity was uh, was the really the religion of of Western society and but I'm embracing this new world and it's hard it's not easy and I, I understand that because it's a, it's and here's what I mean by it's we're so much sim similar to first century than any others because in first century there was a pluralism there were many different gods there were many different religions there were so much different types of philosophy and rome embraced them when they would when rome would, would conquer a country it would embrace that culture except it would say okay you can do these things even saying to the Christians, you can do these things, but you have to also pay homage to the emperor. You also have to do our things. And that's where the Christians got in trouble. They said, we're not gonna do that. And so there does come a time when, when we have to make a stand. One of the, the phrases um, that got um, ridiculed this past year was thoughts and prayers. You're my thoughts and prayers. And, and some people would say, I don't care about your thoughts and prayers. What are you going to do? You know, and I thought they didn't quite understand what we were trying to say when we were saying you're in our thoughts and prayers. We're, we're really concerned about what you're going through. But it was kind of ridiculed. I, I just want to close with this one story um, about how do we how do we live now in a culture that is less and less Christian? Um, how do we be Christians in that? And that's I think it's it's something we're all trying to learn. But when, back in Indiana, I had a colleague who worked um, in a uh, it was he, it was called Associated Churches. And he was the director. And when they were sitting in my backyard and we were talking, he was talking about a lawsuit that was being uh, going against his uh, organization. Because what they also did, they, they, it was a food bank and they would distribute the food from local churches. So they would deliver the food to the churches. People would come and pick them up at the churches. But they also had a program 
called religious education and they were teaching religion uh, teaching christianity uh in the public schools but they would have to have these trailers that weren't connected to the school but they were on the site of the school so there was a there was a uh, legal organization uh called the alcu that um there's a lawsuit against kind of a separation between church and state. And, um, and I remember my friend and I sitting and saying, he was like, I don't want to have this fight. I don't, you know, I don't. And he said, I just, we just, we just want to bless these children in whatever way we can. So what they ended up doing was they didn't go to court but they sold all of these, all of these trailers where the kids, they get consent from parents that the kids could go in for an hour to learn about, you know, Jesus. So they sold all that. They got rid of that whole entire program of education. And they started a group called Rising Stars. And Jocelyn actually happened to be one of the, one of the first, uh, people that uh, worked for him in this new program. And what Rising Stars was, was he, they connected the churches to the public school system, to, like to whatever public school. So if there's an elementary school in the neighborhood, uh, these Rising Stars, they were like community organizers, like old President Obama. And they would they would go to the churches and they would and then they would go to the school and they'd say to the school, what do you need? How can we bless you? And it could be like backpacks for the kids or the teachers were, uh, you know, paying for supplies out of their own pocket. And so they found out what the needs were in the schools and they connected the churches so that the churches could get those needs to the schools. And what happened was they averted a big, huge political uh, legal controversy that would have been thousands upon thousands of dollars. But they got the churches to finally connect with the school and develop a relationship. What about the children Well, then they had the opportunity to come they, what was happening was the, they would see that these churches cared and it got some of these kids and their families interested in the local churches to hear the message at the local churches level. Uh, they, got, they also got parents involved in parenting classes. And, and so it, it was a different way of bringing the gospel leading with love, uh, acts of love, and then bringing, bringing the message later. And to me, I think that's a good model for how we can be the church in this world that's anti-church. Lead with these acts of love. And then as I, one, of the, one of the letters of Peter says, be ready at a time to share the joy that you have in your heart, the, the, the joy of the love of God, but do it with gentleness. And so to me, I think that's one of the ways that we can not be lukewarm, but introduce people to, to Jesus in a way that it doesn't become a, you know, um, an, an encounter of, of us and them, I guess, for lack of a better term. And that's what the early church was doing. What the, the, the early church grew because people saw the love that they had that they didn't see anywhere else in the society. And they were like, I want that. And that's how they grew. So I think... I think we just have to learn from first century sisters and brothers to stand up and lead with love. And that's the end of the sermon. <laughs>
So I think we got through uh, Revelation chapter three. Thank you everybody for your help. Uh, interesting, uh, just to kind of lead to what's going on in chapter four, we're gonna be transported almost like Star Trek, right? Into the heavenly realm. And so it's gonna be, again, more imagery, more metaphor and, and uh, to decipher and to look at and to see what God's saying to, to us, the churches. It's, this message isn't just for those seven churches in Asia Minor. It's for you and I today. So let's close with a word of prayer. Gracious God, thank you. Thank you for um, the faithful witnesses from the past um, who stood up and spoke your truth that there is one God and uh, paid a price. Lord, help us to not be complacent, to not be lukewarm, to not just go through the motions, but to have daily revivals of your spirit, to be open to your spirit's continual intervention in our lives so that we may be faithful to you and to your word. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. All right. Thank you, everybody, and have a great week. See you later. Pat. Yep. Take care, Pat. <laughs> <laughs>